some of the world's best healthcare systems brought to the brink. Whole cities ground almost to a standstill. Thousands of people losing their lives. And so far, there's no end in sight. That the grim reality of the coronavirus outbreak right here in Europe. And if all of that can happen here in one of the richest regions in the world, what about countries that don't have those resources? Across the global south, infections are lagging quite far behind Europe. But many countries have started taking drastic action and people are bracing for the worst. There's a huge fear that the weight of this pandemic might lead to a complete collapse of the Colombian healthcare system. So the lockdown is truly going to be crucial for India because if it doesn't work, we definitely are looking at perhaps the worst outbreak that the world has seen. And we're going to talk to an expert in fighting deadly outbreaks who says there is still reason for hope, even in some of the world's poorest regions. For me, I am optimistic that it is possible for the countries in sub-Saharan Africa to break the transmission. It is possible to contain this outbreak. We're going to find out the essential things that governments and people need to be doing now to achieve that. But before we get to that, let's check in on the outbreak in three of the most important cities in the Global South. We're going to head first to India, home to 1.3 billion people. Its capital city region alone has a population of almost 30 million. The streets of Delhi are usually packed with traffic and full of life. Now they're under lockdown, much like those in Europe. People are only allowed out to go and get essentials. It's being called the biggest curfew ever anywhere in the world. The three-week measure was announced by Prime Minister Narendra Modi in an impassioned address to the nation. It was dramatic language from Modi and he tapped deep into his well of popularity among Indian voters to drive that sense of urgency home before the outbreak hits the levels that we've seen here in Europe. One of the theories about why India actually kicked into lockdown mode so early is that perhaps the government is acknowledging that our healthcare system cannot quite manage a true outbreak, the kinds of which we have seen in Europe. Italy ho ya America. In deshon ki swasth seva, corona ka prabhav kam nahi kar paaye. The Prime Minister has also announced uh, a significant fund to uh, contribute to healthcare, some 15,000 crores, which is about 2 billion euros. This is going to go towards uh, uh, protective equipment, testing material, ventilators. So there is an effort to ramp up healthcare, but there's also a sense that the focus of India is more on prevention than trying to manage an actual outbreak. There's little doubt that India's healthcare system would be overwhelmed by a major escalation. In some areas, workers are going door to door trying to track infections. The worst case scenario truly is that this virus reaches uh, communities which live very close together, uh, like the urban poor, who live in uh, slum conditions where it's, it's not possible to practice social distancing, it's not possible to practice self-isolation. Once the virus gets to those communities, uh, controlling the spread would be nearly impossible and providing health care to all of those people's uh, thousands and millions of people would also be extremely difficult. So the lockdown is truly going to be crucial for India because if it doesn't work, we definitely are looking at perhaps the worst outbreak that the world has seen. But many poor Indians feel they have no choice but to defy the lockdown. Migrant workers in Delhi have suddenly lost all of their income and they're trying to get back home to villages in the surrounding states. The government is offering help, but can it reach everyone? DW spoke to one worker and his family who've started a long walk home. 
he said that you know the prime minister is right we should not be going back to our village but what am i supposed to do i have to feed my children and uh, we are taking this risk but it's better that uh, we die somewhere else together than starve to death in the capitals it's a horrifying dilemma that's likely to face countless more migrant workers across the developing world as more and more lockdowns come into effect. What's the picture in sub-Saharan Africa? Let's go next to Nairobi, one of the region's main economic hubs. People in Kenya are being urged to abide by social distancing and washing their hands. But the government has so far not followed India into a nationwide lockdown. The latest move has been a nighttime curfew. There will be a daily curfew from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning, with all movement by persons not authorized to do so or not being medical professionals, health workers, critical and essential service providers being prohibited. But will that be enough? People here are anxious about what's next. Especially when people are looking to Europe and what's happening in Italy and Spain and so on, they're very worried about, uh, about the situation there and what that could mean for a country like Kenya or any other country in Africa where the health system uh, is already struggling in many cases. Kenya has been trying to boost its hospital capacity and it's been showing off this new isolation ward in Nairobi. But there are huge concerns about what's going to happen outside the capital. But the further you go out, the further you go into rural areas, um, it gets, uh, it, it, there's very little uh, in, terms of, in terms of capacity. So, um, for example, I've been speaking to some people from, from the counties and they're setting up isolation units at the moment. Um, they're also trying to kind of get um, get medical schools and so on, or um, dorms, um, which, are, which are empty at the moment, um, which they can use for isolation centers. But at the moment, they basically have a handful of beds um, which are available in rural areas. Now, even much richer countries, of course, share those fears about their healthcare systems facing up to the coronavirus crisis. Let's go now to Colombia in South America. It's regarded as a middle-income country, and is three to four times richer than Kenya or India. In the capital, Bogota, the government has been preparing a military hospital to add capacity to the healthcare system. But many ordinary Colombians have long-standing worries about getting access to treatment when they need it. There is universal health care here, but the system is severely stratified. So if you want actually good health care, you need to pay on top of the basic coverage that you get from the state. Um, there's long lines, days of waiting in emergency rooms in normal times. So there's a huge fear that the weight of this pandemic might lead to a complete collapse of the Colombian health care system. Colombia has enacted a nationwide lockdown, one that's left Bogota's streets eerily empty, apart from a heavy military presence. But along Colombia's border with Venezuela, there's a reminder that the outbreak comes on top of a deeper crisis in the region. Streams of Venezuelans continue to cross illegally in search of food and medical supplies for their families. Two million of them have ended up staying in Colombia, and they are now some of the most vulnerable to the economic fallout of the lockdown. These people quite literally live from hand to mouth. They pay their shelter at night with the money they make during the day and without the ability of going out and making money, these people have no place to go. That's why in the past days we've seen protests in several cities around Colombia organized and led by Venezuelans who were asking for financial assistance, they were asking for food and for shelter, because with a country in lockdown, they don't know how to survive. 
Now, if you take all of those problems that we've been hearing about and put them together, they can seem absolutely overwhelming. You've got weak healthcare systems, large populations living under precarious living conditions, a big gap between rich and poor. Now, all of that makes it all the more important to act early. The outbreak is evolving very fast. Um, so many countries are reporting many more cases. Um, the situation has changed from what we had last week uh, to today. We have seen a significant change in most of the countries. And uh, the capacity to respond is what we need to ramp up quickly. So how can countries actually do that? Well, the advice is challenging, but actually quite clear. First of all, social distancing, expanding the capacity of hospitals to treat sick people, and crucially, keeping track of every single new infection for as long as that remains possible. To break the transmission, we have to detect all the cases. Um, new cases being reported, we need to detect them early enough. Uh, we need to isolate those cases to test and confirm them, and also to monitor all the contact, 100% of the contact, uh, so that we can break the chain of transmission. Because if we are not able to do this, then uh, we might end up lagging uh, behind the curve. It sounds like an almost impossible challenge in countries that have very limited resources. But as Mary Stephen of the World Health Organization points out, even some of the poorest regions in the world can sometimes tap into valuable experience, like the recent Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. For me, I am optimistic that it is possible for the countries in sub-Saharan Africa to break the transmission. It is possible to contain this outbreak. The region has responded to really big, big outbreaks, major outbreaks. And uh, they, we have been able to contain this outbreak after battling with some of those outbreaks uh, that occurred in complex situations like uh, the Ebola outbreak in DRC, where you have already an ongoing humanitarian crisis with Ebola on top of that, which brought a different dynamics to the response. And in addition to that, countries have been responding. Cholera outbreak occurs day in, day out in our region, meningitis, Lassa fever, and a lot of our countries have responded and contained this outbreak. So these capacities also, uh, they can use this capacity to also um, detect early and respond to COVID-19. So it's like an advantage because they have responded to one form of, of emergency or the other. So they are kind of, I think, a bit much more alert in terms of uh, responding uh, to these emergencies. Of course, every nation across the global south will be drawing on all the local experience it can find as they face up to this crisis. These are decisive days that will determine how bad the outbreak gets.